Gestalt language processing, AAC, ethics. We are getting into it in a future course here at ABA Speech. Did you know that at www.abaspeech.org, I list all of our upcoming CEU courses. Every single month, I do a live course, either myself or a speaker, and the next coming months for our back to school, I said it, back to school time, we're going to be talking about the ethics of collaboration around the ideas of Gestalt language processing, AAC, verbal imitation. In September, we're going to be talking about naturalistic interventions. We have so many wonderful things in store. Now, these CEUs, you can register for the webinars completely free, and that is going to be a link in the show notes. So make sure that you register. If you want to purchase a general certificate, that's $5. Members of the ABA Speech Connection membership, are you in the membership yet? If not, join us. There's over 300 professionals and parents in the membership. You get your CEUs completely free as part of your membership. But if you're like, hey, Rose, I'm not ready for the membership. That is okay too, because every single month you have the option to just pay for your single CEU. These are ASHA approved and ACE approved courses for BCBAs, professionals, and anybody who wants to attend. So make sure that you check the notes in the show notes that is going to have the link that will take you to register for our upcoming live events around the ideas of ethics, collaboration, Gestalt language processing, AAC, naturalistic interventions, and so much more. I cannot wait to see you on a future live course. Susanna P. Slavelle is the guest on the show today, and we have an amazing conversation all about her family's autism journey. Her daughter, Arizona, has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, anxiety, and food allergies. And she has written a wonderful book, Your True Self is Enough. Arizona, her daughter, wrote the foreword to the book, and she really shares today her journey of When her daughter was born, she had food allergies. She was crying all the time. Then when they got that all situated, she really felt like developmentally something is not clicking here. This is not right. She seems like she's struggling. They talked to people in their area. They said, don't worry about it. She's fine. She just had all those allergies. Now she's going to develop. And we talk all about what that journey looked like, what her school journey looked like, how she's doing now. This is really a wonderful, thought-out book that is easy to consume. I think as clinicians, it makes us so much better when we have on the podcast autistic individuals and autism moms, autism dads, because that allows us to understand on a a better level, we're not truly going to understand, but understand how they are working through the autism journey. So I'm excited for this conversation today with Susanna Peace Lavelle. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Welcome to the Autism Outreach Podcast. Today, we have a wonderful guest. We have Susanna Peace Lavelle with us. Thank you so much for joining us and coming on the show. Hi, Rose. So happy to be here. Um, And I came across your book, Your True Self is Enough. And I... One, I just, I feel like I want to write a book someday, but it seems very daunting. So kudos mm. to you for writing a book. Yeah. I always think like maybe someday, you know, like I'm always like so busy. I'm like maybe someday, but this is a very nice read for practitioners and parents. And I like that you tell kind of your personal journey of your family, your daughter, your your journey as well, um, but that you have some really nice take-home points in the chapter. So it's like a very easy read. I'm in a book club now, so I've been reading some stuff that's easy to read and some that isn't, but this 
This is really mm-hmm. good. Um, so just tell me a little bit about, I guess, your journey. The book is kind of about your journey, but also your daughter's. I guess what inspired you to write the book? Because on a personal level, I'm kind of interested. Um, it's a big yeah. undertaking to write a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Rose. So what I was going to say is that, okay, so yeah, writing a book is daunting. It is daunting. <laughs> So this actual uh, process took me a full 10 years, start to finish. So just so you know, um, (laughs) I, you know, I definitely have always been a writer. I'm so obsessed with, you know, writing in journals. I got my first journal when I was 13 years old, and I've written in a journal ever since then. Uh, And I have every single one of them. (laughs) I have all the copies, you know, it's so funny that. To look back and see what you could turn that into a book. I was actually just at a business conference called CEX here in Cleveland with all these content creators, and that could become a book. (laughs) Amazing. Okay, so I yes, I would have to edit it a little (laughs) of uh, writing for an audience, but you know, it's always been a therapeutic process for me, and so I decided that I wanted to share my story in a way that could be supportive and of service to other parents like me. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was a new mom, and certainly when my daughter, Arizona, was first diagnosed with autism, and then, you know, myriad diagnoses a little bit before and after that, Mm -hmm. I felt very, very isolated. And I felt very alone. I felt very much in the dark. And, you know, we live here in Los Angeles, California, which is chock full of resources. And still, I felt very much like, wow, I just kind of have to roll up my sleeves and figure this out by myself, truly. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, and so I wanted to share my story in a way that was, you know, sort of anecdotal in terms of, you know, part memoir, but then also part sort of roadmap slash you know, guidebook for, you know, uh, those out there who are struggling with trying mm-hmm. to figure out what to do now, what to do next, what to not mm-hmm. do, what, what, you know, and we all have different journeys, obviously. Uh, and there are some things that I think can be assistful uh, to all of us um, in my book. And so, and I wrote, I'm so glad that you said it was an easy read because that was my intention. And I was thinking, mm-hmm. you know, we all, we, you know, me as a caregiver, as a care, extreme caregiver, mm-hmm. mother, I, I don't, I love reading, you know, delicious 350 page tomes, <laughs> you know, but I just don't, I don't have the time and the energy. Right. So, so um, I had that in mind as well. So I appreciate that. Yes. Feedback. Oh, good. I love that. Um. So tell us a little bit about your journey. It seemed like when your daughter was born, she was your first child. Is that yep. correct? First okay. Child. And it seemed like just like from the beginning, she was having a lots of difficulties like with feeding. And I saw that you had a night nurse at one time and you had some guilt around that. And then you had your kind of your own medical and health journeys. Can you just kind of talk us through she's born and, and then what happens? Cause there are a lot of stressful kind of things that all kind of transpired. Yes. So just to give a little bit of background, um, my daughter's now 18 years old. So she just turned 18. She likes to remind me that she's a legal adult now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a whole nother set of challenges. Uh, <laughs> but certainly as a new mom, I was really, really like, I could not wait to be a mom. So there was that. I was like obsessed with motherhood from the very beginning of time. So I was really looking forward to it, that I was super well trained. I have a lot of siblings. I babysat a lot. I'm around kids a lot. So I just thought that I was very well equipped uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically. And that just was not the case because at every turn, I felt like my experience was so unexpected. Mm -hmm. Uh, Definitely much different than the vision that I had originally had for myself, Mm -hmm. for motherhood. So it was, you know, it was stressful in that way. Uh, I was trying to shift and change and learn how to be flexible, which is a very hard thing for challenging thing for me and my controlling type A personality. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, um, you know, I just, I just felt like very much a failure in the very beginning because I wasn't uh, being able to understand all of my child's needs. She had a lot of them and she cried a lot. And it turns out that you know, she was initially diagnosed with severe food allergies. She still has a lot of food allergies. That was a very 
troubling and challenging time because Mm -hmm. um, it was scary. It was very scary. Mm -hmm. And while she's sort of being diagnosed with that first stage of the motherhood journey for me, I fell into a debilitating episode of postpartum anxiety and depression. Yeah. And so I, you know, I have had those episodes before in my life, but I never knew what to label them. Mm-hmm. And I never, for sure, was never taking care of anyone else <laughs> when I was going through these episodes. Right. So it was just kind of like, you know, doubling down on the stress and the anxiety. And so I felt like there's so much going on. Um, it was very challenging for me to ask for help and receive help. It's very not in alignment with my personality at all. I'm very Mm -hmm. capable, you know, I'm very resourceful. I can figure it out. And um, it was really such a troubling journey. And then the diagnoses kept continuing. So. Mm -hmm. Right. That's really hard. And so what I think what I I felt it was hard for you, you couldn't sleep. I mean, I think that's something important to point out that I felt like that's got to be so hard. Here you have a baby. It's maybe not what you had expected. You were, you had a vision of maybe what it was going to be like, and then it wasn't. So that's probably a whole host of emotions. Then you yourself cannot sleep and then are, are getting cared for in that way too. Like what you said, you know, you're used to like being able to take care of yourself, but now you're having to take care of somebody else who it seems like she was getting diagnosed with, right? The food allergies and crying and upset and, I can't imagine how that was. And you did your your mom came out to help you or you did have some family support there. Right? Um I did. I you know, I certainly would have done it differently had mm-hmm. I planned it a little bit better, but again, I was thinking was, I got this, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm good here. Right. I'm good doing here. Yeah. So my mom uh, is a professor, uh, still is to this day. And so my daughter was born in the summertime. And so she had the summer off and she came to live with us for a week. And it was the most amazing and delicious week of my (laughs) life because I felt like an instant bond and connection with her as soon Mm -hmm. as I had my daughter. And um, I don't know, it just, everything seemed easier with her Mm. her because, you know, we're going to the (laughs) motions, but she's there with me and, you know, helped me give Arizona her first bath. I mean, all of these things were so beautiful and lovely and amazing. And my husband at the time, we have since divorced, uh, but he was working from home for that first week as well. And this was back in the day when remote yeah. work was really that common. So he was home for a week. My mother <laughs> was with me for a week. And I was like, once again, I got this. <laughs> right. Right? Once again. Um, but then when he went back to work and my mother left, I just remembered holding my baby and standing on the porch, on the front porch, and just weeping, sobbing. I mean, my emotions were already so all over, up and down because yeah. of my hormones and everything else. Um, so it was it was a very, very, very <laughs> emotional time. And it just kept getting harder and harder for me from that point. Yeah, it's hard. You do feel alone. I lived in, so I'm from Ohio. We were talking before. And Mm -hmm. I lived in Austin, Texas for three years because of my husband's work. And I had my first baby down there. And it's like, I couldn't even drive my parents to the airport. Like I was just like, after a while, I would just be like sobbing, Sobbing. depressed the entire weekend. I just felt really lonely out there. But now I've lived back in Ohio and that's been good for me. Um, But you do, you feel really isolated, you know, especially not being kind of where you're from. It's and, And honestly, it's like nice to make mom friends, but it's like, once your kids get older, that doesn't happen like when your baby's born. Um, it's hard. There's a lot of hard things. So so talk us through Arizona's kind of, so she's diagnosed with the food allergies and then kind of what else did her development and that trajectory kind of look like? Yeah, great question. So initially she was crying all the time. So I, you know, obviously there was something going on above and beyond like just colic right. because it, you know, it just went w- well beyond the three month marker. Um And then she started developing rashes, eczema, started covering her body until she was pretty much covered head to toe Mm. in eczema. And so it just took a while to get the actual like official food allergy diagnoses because they have to do prick tests. They did blood tests. They did so many different tests. Mm -hmm. And and she was covered in rashes. It was actually even hard for them to find a clean surface 
on her back to do the actual prick test. So it took a while to figure out exactly what the specific allergies were. And so that was a journey and a process. And again, she's crying, crying, crying. I'm trying to placate her. I'm trying to make her as comfortable as possible, but it was just so, it was almost impossible because Mm of, you know, how everything was manifesting physically on her body. Mm -hmm. And so it took about 18 months, the first 18 months of her life, by the way, she cried nonstop for the first 18 months of her life. And it was really not until that point that we had really figured out the food allergies had organized, you know, what she needed to eat and supplement in terms of nutrients and the eczema like slowly started to leave her body. It was, it was phenomenal to witness. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's when we were kind of like, huh, now we can start from here. Mm -hmm. And now she's sort of awakening to the world Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. prior to that, it was just, she just wanted to scratch herself all the time. She just, you know, even when she was, we put her down to, you know, start learning how to crawl. She would just scratch her head in the Aww. in the carpet. And, you know, so, yeah. so we thought there were, you know, one of my sisters who was a mother already at that point was like, you know, there's something different about Arizona. Maybe mm-hmm. you should have her checked out. And we went to a few specialists and the first one was kind of like, oh yeah, well, you know, nothing is wrong. You know, everything is, de- she's developing normally. Hmm. Uh, it's just that she had all of these medical issues for the first 18 months of her life. And so hmm. she's just going to be delayed in terms of now she can open up and see the outside world, but she'll just get caught up, mm-hmm. you know? And I said, okay. Um, and I just had to check in with my mommy gut. Cause that just didn't, that just didn't really sit. Yeah. Right with- so we kept going and kept asking, mm-hmm. you know, more questions. Right. And then you finally, when does she get diagnosed and how old was she when she got diagnosed as being autistic? Because then you do talk about her um, services, then she's getting certain services and you t- discuss that in the book as well, which is, that's why I like to have parents on and people with autism, because I think it makes us, you know, it makes us better providers to to hear your stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, when did, when did she get diagnosed then? As having she autism. was diagnosed around two and a half years old. Oh, so okay. Yeah. That was the autism spectrum diagnosis, yep. um, aut- autism spectrum disorder diagnosis rather. Mm-hmm. And that was, well, that was very challenging to hear. Uh, it was very unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. Again, this was, you know, let's see, my daughter's 18 now. So Long this is, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The incidence rate was different. And I mean, they used to say, and it's, I don't even say it anymore, but they used to say, and it's four to one. It used to be 242, one in 242 births when I started presenting, like maybe 15 Mm -hmm. years ago, and four to one boys. They always said that. They may still say that on the CDC website, but I've had Mm -hmm. enough autistic females on that are late diagnosed that I don't say that Mm -hmm. anymore. I don't even talk about it anymore like that because I think that's probably wrong somewhere. Um, Okay, yeah. So that was really... Because now I feel like it is one in 36, I think now. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I feel like... And with inclusion and supports and the neurodiversity movement, I do think... I mean, I'm in the autism world, so but I do think more people know about autism and it's on the radar of of the general population, I would think. For 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 sure. For yeah. for certain. For certain. Yeah. For certain. Yeah. I it, but again, you know, 15 and a half years ago was a much different story. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so that was that was very challenging and you know, mm-hmm. it sort of compounded my feelings of isolation and mm-hmm. uh, not being able to find community, uh, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So then were you, how did services go when she started getting, I know she got occupational therapy. It seemed like speech therapy. How did that go when you started then taking her for, for her various treatments? So it was an interesting time. I think that I was sort of you know, wide eyed and, uh, you know, during the headlights, but also very much like, okay, so now there's a plan, right? right? So tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of transitioned into, 
you know, the let's go do it, warrior, mommy, mm-hmm. let's figure it out. Um, again, very much in alignment with my personality. Right. Uh, let me figure it out. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just kind of go, go, go from there. There were a little, you know, there were a couple of bumps in the road in terms of like, you know, you there are so many different therapists and offerings. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, you know, always jive with every single person who we're going to be put in front of. And so we didn't have a lot of choice and option back then. It's just kind of like who was vendored with the regional center or what did our insurance cover, you know, all of the above. And so um, I remember Arizona's first, 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 first experience with speech therapy was, um, was completely underwhelming. You know, I was sitting there and observing and, and the lady, the speech pathologist was basically just like holding up Skittles, you know, Oh, to really? try, try oh. to get Arizona's like eye contact or attention oh. or it was. And I was thinking, okay, this is a child with like so many food issues and food allergies and aversions. And so she's never seen a Skittle. Like that's not fun for like, th- th- that means nothing to her. I, it just, Felt very much like um, she was training an animal. Yeah, Felt all along. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it, just, especially with the food allergies. Like, I never use food in therapy, but food allergies, like, that's like, no. That's, I mean, it's, it's big it, no. Tur- it turns out that technically Arizona is not allergic to Skittles because oh. Skittles is like, you know, <laughs> whatever, chemical and red dye. I don't know what it is. <laughs> But it's show, you're in you're in LA. You probably eat a lot healthier than I do. I'm not saying I eat Twinkies anymore, but I mean, I was raised on Twinkies and in, in, uh, pop tarts. I mean, I'm I'm from Ohio. I mean, my mom is 86. She still brings pop tarts over. I'll tell love you what, it. my kids love them. They do. Yeah, love them. Delicious. Probably Delicious. two a year. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> do need to work on the. Uh, I'm not doing wheatgrass shots or anything that's very healthy. I'm I'm definitely feeling like. I need to eat something healthier tonight for dinner. You've inspired me. Um, I know people in California eat a lot healthier than I do. But but I don't, I don't (laughs) eat grass shots either. Okay. 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 But it's available. I'm just saying when you go on the West coast, I'm always amazed at, but I do, you know, I do Pilates every day and I, you know, try to do yoga, but um, it's just, it's easier to be healthier out West. I feel like there's just a bigger focus on health, especially, you know, and where you're located versus where I'm located. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. So I'm surprised at the skill story just because of kind of your geographic location. I wouldn't think that would be. Yeah. And, you know, I think that is, uh, you know, because I do parent coaching and um, coaching for professionals too that are international. So it's like, it, what's hard now is like um, now that services, a lot of service, you know, ABA and speech and all that are covered by insurance parents do have a lot more choices here in the United States and definitely depends on your geographic area because you might be in an area where for speech therapy, if you have to go through insurance provider, there's a huge wait list. So some people might be listening and like, oh, wow, it's nice to have choices. But with that becomes a lot of decision fatigue too, because there's probably a set amount of choices that are covered by insurance and how that's all going to work is, is another stressor I can imagine. For sure. Yeah. And then for her school, it seemed that I was a little, just because I am here in Ohio and I think California is different. Did she go to, and I know it sounded like she changed schools, but was it a public school, but you had to get into a lottery system that I was a little bit confused Mm -hmm. on. Would you speak to that? Because I, that's something I was just talking to a parent um, in our ABA speech connection membership last night. We do these little case study talks. We were talking about her son and he's getting ready to start school, a public school. And um, we were just talking about the school options versus staying in therapy therapy and things like that. So how did that work for Arizona? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So initially, um, Arizona went to just typical little preschool school two days a week, mornings a week, nine to 12. And this was before she was diagnosed. So we, so she was probably around two years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember I chose this particular program because number one, I could walk to it from our content at the time. (laughs) And number two, they didn't require potty training. Okay. And Arizona was a very late potty trainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, she was not even close to even learning how to potty train yet when she was two. Oh, and so little. a lot of like preschools were just mm-hmm. like, yeah, must be potty trained. So mm-hmm. those were the two criteria that were like, okay, this will work. Um, but it was during that time that, you know, we started the diagnosis process and, um, and, you know, it just wasn't a good fit for her. So then yeah. through the regional center, through getting funding um, for, 
you know, her diagnosis, we were able to put her into sort of like a preschool setting, like a therapeutic preschool setting. Mm -hmm. From there, um, she applied to different schools. Um, We were looking at some independent schools. We were looking at some uh, sort of public charter schools. Mm -hmm. And two of them were lottery based. And one of them was based on, you know, sort of she had to come in and be interviewed and um, and she got into that. She actually got into all three schools, but the other two, since they were lottery based, we were like, eh, but you don't really know our child. Um, yeah. and, so, and with the the independent school that she got into for developmental kindergarten yeah, at the age of five, we were like, well, you interviewed her and you thought she could fit in. Mm-hmm. And we were so upfront with her right. challenges and issues and yeah. Um, and they were like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think she'll be fine. And, you know, she did all of the answered all the questions and but it turns out that was not the best fit for her. And so after about uh, maybe six months there, they sort of were like, yeah, this is not going to work out. And so I ended up pulling her out in April of that first school mm-hmm. year. Um, but I had found out about another therapeutic program called Cheerful Helpers Child and Family Study Center, which I write about extensively in this book, two chapters uh, exclusively. And it ended up being like the best kept secret. (laughs) It still is the best kept secret. Should not be in Los Angeles. And it was a small, tiny little program. I still sit on the, uh, I actually sit on the board of directors for them now. It's been so life-changing for us. And then from there, after she was there for about, two and a half years, then she entered into the Los Angeles Unified School District public mm-hmm. school system starting yeah. first grade. And she still is uh, in LAUSD, uh, currently in high school. And it has been a phenomenal um, yeah. place for us in terms oh, of right. resources and support. For oh, her wonderful. Needs. Yeah, I had yeah. an interview I had on the podcast, um, Shelly Bader. She was the head speech therapist a long time ago, which is, I'm amazed. It's a huge undertaking. That district is, you huge. know, it's huge. I mean, I just love the inner workings of that. It was really interesting to talk to her. Um, yeah, it's just such a big district. How cool. So what does your, what does your daughter think of the book? I'm curious. I have a 13 year old, almost 14 and, uh, she terrifies me sometimes. Yes. Um, so what what did she think about the book? Is she like your advocacy or is she, do you guys ever do things together? Because I had, um, it'll air mm-hmm. after your episode, but I have a member in my AB Speech Connection membership, Cindy, and her and her daughter. Her daughter is a little bit younger, like maybe two years younger um, mm-hmm. than your daughter, it has some similar uh, diagnoses. And she came on the podcast. They came on as a mother-daughter mm-hmm. uh, duo. And it was, it was neat because her daughter shared about her therapy and what's been helpful, what hasn't been. And what school placement was helpful and things like that. Um, yeah. So what does Arizona think of the book and all the things you're doing? So she's, she's okay with the book now, but she wasn't always okay with me telling her story or me yeah. talking about her. Right. And so the book that you have with you right now yes. is in its like 78th iteration. <laughs> yeah. so, so, and you know, she's always known that I've been writing, 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 And, um, she knew that I wanted to share my story with the world to be helpful. And so she, you know, one of her first sort of markers and understanding what was going on was I started letting her, you know, read the book. I started reading different chapters to her and she Mm -hmm. had feelings about it in terms of like, that doesn't feel so good for people to know that and Mm -hmm. know that that is me. Yeah. So I just don't want my name in the book. Um, it sort of threw me off because I had this entire title planned out. <laughs> da, 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 da. Right. And um, and so, you know, we sort of came to a compromise in terms of what would you like readers to know about this book? And mm-hmm. so she wrote the foreword. Mm-hmm. And in the foreword, she actually says, I just want people to know that your true self is enough. Aww. And so that is how I got the title of my book. So I took out a lot of like extra information yeah. about, you know, maybe some of the things that might be not so fun for her to hear about herself. Right. Yeah. Um, and again, that's why it's sort of like, like I said, like part memoir, part guidebook to accommodate for that. Um, it was very important for me to honor her, mm-hmm. uh, her wishes and, um, and also very important for me to honor my you know, journey and wanting yeah. to share 
my story. You know, mm-hmm. this is my story. You're in it for <laughs> sure. This is part of right. our journey. Right. And, you know, this is my voice. Yeah, I love that. Amazing. So if you had to give one piece of advice to parents who maybe think their child has a delay or they're going through the autism evaluation process or they're on a wait list to get an autism evaluation, because we know that is true in some parts of the world, um, what would your one piece of advice be for parents? Yeah, and especially if a parent is sort of already sort of leaning this way, um, thinking or having the gut feeling that something is maybe different, I would say to just stay so in tune with that, you know, that instinct, that mama gut, that papa gut, whatever it is, the caregiver gut, Mm -hmm. and just, you know, as, as much as possible, just sort of take notes, observe, like listen to your child, um, even if they are non-speaking, uh, you know, c- kind of tapping into and tuning into their energy, their behaviors, and no detail is too little. Um, I-, I would just start writing everything down, um, just the way that they are in the world, the way that they are at home, what are the things that seem preferred, what are the things that don't seem preferred, what, you know, just sort of tap into all of those things. And then once you can get in front of someone, or actually before you can even get in front of somebody, to just be as tenacious as possible, even if that is not your personality, Mm -hmm. I am saying to you, like being an advocate for your child really requires, in my opinion, to just be seeking out as much help as possible. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that energy and intention around something is different. And I am just so curious and wondering about this child. And if you can talk in that way, instead of like, well, I need answers and I need to figure this out and you need to tell me what to do and you need to get me into it. You know, again, I'm saying whatever you need to do that, that, that feels in alignment with you, everything is okay. Everything will be okay. And I have found that the doors are open a little bit more when I can be as vulnerable and asking for as much help as possible. Um, I feel like, you know, that has been really helpful for me and just knowing, you know, as much as I can about my own child to share with said professionals or whoever will, (laughs) whoever will listen, even if it's someone at the front desk. I mean, I've had to advocate for myself, like, no, no, no. I know that she's not taking any new patients, but you don't understand, you know, mm-hmm. I have this, right. And that has actually helped too. So man, um, being the squeaky wheel, but in a, but a nice wheel, mm-hmm. you know? yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I just mm-hmm. need your help. Please, please, please. Yes. Yeah. It's all about that ongoing communication. Well, I love it. Thank you so much for coming on and pick up your true self is enough. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. It was delightful to meet you. Thanks, Rose. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.